What is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Guarani Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. As always, I'm Robert Rojas, and joining me are my three great co-hosts, Federico Perez, Ralph Hanna, and Maria Britos. And guys, here we are. We're at the end of May. We're at the end of the near completion of the Apertura season. We have a champion, something that we've already mentioned it over a few weeks that we, you know, kind of thought that maybe there was going to be some sort of title race, but alas, we do not have that. We do have a champion. It is a familiar name. We're going to talk about who that familiar name is in just a bit. We have some crucial games happening in the Copa Libertadores and the Sudamericana for teams that will be competing in them and for obviously their uh, chances of going into like the next round and, and maybe even going into the Sudamericana um, for some of these teams. We'll talk about who and what's at stake here. We also have to talk about what our European players are doing. You know, the players based in Europe, obviously having great seasons. Some of the names that we've already mentioned beforehand playing in England, but also one in particular in Italy who, you know, maybe their side hasn't been able to do well this season in Serie A, but there's always one player that's in the top goal scoring sh- uh, stats. And, you know, we'll talk about who in just a minute, but let me get someone who clearly has had a better beard in person than what I've been able to see on Zoom calls here. And that's Fede, Perez. Fede, I mean, you know, I was uh, fortunate enough to go see the, uh, the Cerro and Luqueño game that, you know, I was able to go to Paraguay last week to see the Super Clásico and also to see the Luqueño Cerro game where I was able to meet you. But, you know, you, you have really taken that beard into consideration for what I'm seeing. I'm looking at this guy's like, no, it can't be real. It can't be that good. But, man, it's uh, you're hanging strong over there, even as the, as the weather gets colder over there in Paraguay. People are telling me I'm not going to be able to pull this off, Roberto. I'm going for the year. I'm going for 12 months, buddy. I'm, I'm only at four. So, yeah, don't even don't even get me started about the beard. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new experience for me. Uh, yeah, it was great seeing you here in Paraguay. It was great talking about a, a game. It, it wasn't so nice when we were leaving the game. I, I remember I was taking you from the from the stadium to a point B. You, you were getting uh, along with other friends and... And as we were leaving the stadium, we were leaving Defensores de Chaco, uh, guys. Uh, Luqueño, Luqueño fans were, were, were leaving the stadium, but that, they weren't the problem. The problem was between Cerro Porteño fans. They were going at each other, two, two sides from the, from, the, from the barra were going at it right there in the streets. And I was telling Roberto, oh, we got to get out of here, buddy. So we took another road. We had to get out of there. That's the whole Paraguayan experience. Also, it's just part of going to the stadium here, Roberto. It's just part of going to the game. I uh, hope you had fun. Also in the Super Classico, oh, my God, uh, that was a huge one here. And I think that was the downfall also for Cerro Porteño probably, right? The only team that had the opportunity to really catch up to this Libertad who just blew away in this apertura. And I'm happy. Uh, this was my candidate at the beginning, and they got it done from day one uh, to here. I mean, they only lost two games. They won all the big ones, and they ended up winning it in what a dramatic way, right? Waiting there, listening to the radio, watching the TV, and that last-minute uh, goal from General Caballero came through uh, against Cerro Porteño, and that gave them the championship. That was quite a dramatic scene to see. The players just waiting there to pick up the trophy. And we got so much to go in depth of, of what everything that Libertad did uh, this season to get that championship, obviously. Absolutely. I think it's certainly something that I think was expected. We, Like I said, I thought we were all going to go maybe for at least one sort of title race as we've been accustomed to. But alas, we have not gotten that. I mean, you know, go to Marie on this one, because I think now with the opportunity over and with a lot of these teams, you know, obviously not playing a lot to you know, for nothing really at this point, because obviously the season's over. I think all the attention is going into what the Lirata Ordes is. And I was able to go in into Paraguay and like see some of the vibes and like speaking to some people who are Olympia fans, who are Cerro fans, who are Lirata fans. And, you know, for a lot of these teams, you obviously as an Olympia fan, you know, are in a good position. You know, they play this week against Patronato over there in Argentina. But now this is the main focus for these guys, you know, is to go into the round of 16. My, my cousin, one of my, my close friends and close friends, family members obviously is an Olympia fan and he was just talking about yeah the season's kind of a bust now for in the league but now all the attention is going into the to the Lirata Ordes and so I think this is now a crucial week for a lot of these teams and I think they know that they can't screw up as well. Yeah definitely I, I agree with you there Roberto and everyone um, it, it's been a I think a rough one a rough season for for Olympia but, you know, um, they held their hand up. Uh, they kept going regardless of, you know, 
uh, having their coach fired and, and some other changes within the club. Um, you know, but I, I really think that the, the main focus has always been, um, uh, I mean, you know, you always want to win the Apertura or the Clausura, but, you know, I think one of their main focus has been Libertadores, and I think that they now can do it with a little bit uh, more of a breathing room because they know that this, you know, Apertura is, you know, uh, moving on and it's, they close that chapter already. So yeah, um, and 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 I I think that just like your 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 family member, you know, a lot of fans uh, have felt the same way that you know they really need to focus on on Libertadores because it's been a while for them, and um, you know hopefully that they can continue this road and 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 have a good um, result within the Libertadores. Yeah, not just obviously Olympia, obviously for Cedro, you know, they need to get on the right path. They got a tough game, obviously, that we'll talk about in a bit. Libertad as well, they need to turn it around quickly because at this stage, like if they're not able to get any more wins out of their out of their group stage um, performances, I think not even going to Suamericana would be good enough for them. But we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's switch gears, obviously, to Ralph as well. Uh, unfortunately, a sad Ralph, I'd say, because, you know, certainly his Arsenal have not won the Premier League. Maybe his Miami Heat can give him some joy. I don't like saying that. Obviously, the Celtics fan been seeing it with three other Heat fans in this chat. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly at least one sort of joy that we've been able to see has been the performances of players in England. Obviously, we're speaking about Miguel Miron having a wonderful season for Newcastle. You know, we'll talk about them in a bit, but, you know, going into the Champions League, Julio and C. So not only just, you know, getting his performances now at Brighton, but also scoring, you know, he's scoring against, again, your beloved Arsenal. Don't want to say that a lot here too loud before we all start a fight, but he's been performing well and, you know, in a in a side that continues to transition. And of course, Antonio Sanabria, you know, performing very well at Torino, uh, very well at, at Serie A, you know, heading into the top 10. I think he's like, 13 goals or something for Torino this season, which is better than a lot of players in Syria. And so, yeah, it's good to see that at least with the, really the, the, that, that attacking line, you could really form one for, for the national team. You got the left wing you're in and see so a striker in Sanabria and then the right wing you're in, in Almiron. I mean, it's uh it's been a good season, at least for, you know, what in theory could be Paraguay's front line heading into the, the World Cup qualifiers, which start in a couple months as well. Yeah, that's right. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's let's just touch on Sanabria first. Is I think it's his best season ever as well in terms of league goals. So not just that he's doing well amongst his peers in Serie A, but I think he's done better than the time he was on that loan. He was on loan at Hetafe in La Liga when he was younger. And I think he managed... Gijon. Gijon. Hey, yeah, Gijon. You're yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, um, and right. I think, yeah, he managed he managed over 10 league goals that time, but, the, but this has now surpassed that. So that's good for us talking about the national team, especially because we're having some problems with some of our other strikers. So over in uh, in Houston Dynamos, Seves Pereira hasn't started much. He finally got a start at the weekend when he got subbed off. He was he wasn't happy with his coach. So we, so we have as some players, uh, their star is maybe falling. You have others is rising. But I think it's very exciting that you have Sanabria playing in a top five league. And then, of course, in CISO and Almiron, I think the really interesting thing is they're not just playing in the top five league, league, they're being important parts of their team and they're both those teams have overperformed. So that's really exciting because we've had a long time of players in Paraguay or Paraguayan national team players not being key parts of their teams in Europe. Let's take an, just an example, Balbuena, West Ham. He was never like the number one starter in West Ham and West Ham... As they started playing well, he got dropped out of the team. So I think what we're seeing now, Alderetti, you have someone like Alderetti, who's always played a lot of games in his teams, but those teams haven't performed very well. So now we have three players where they're actually shining within their team. And in the case of Enzo and Almirona, taking them to new heights. I mean, it's, it's huge for Newcastle, for example. It's, it's been 20 years since they've been in the, in the Champions League. And last time it was another South American, it was, it was Solano that got them that was helping them there and now we had they have their new South American in in our own Miguel Miron so it's, it's, it's really exciting uh, for that because I like how you kind of switched to the national team Roberto because suddenly as the league starts to come to an end that's where our minds get taken right naturally we're starting to think about what's going to happen come the qualifiers which are they're going to be upon us sooner than we realize 
Yeah, it's coming by really quick, and and obviously we're going to discuss all that as we go into those qualifiers uh, coming in the next few months. But let's talk about what happened in Paraguay with the league, as we had mentioned before. Henley Rathat are the champions again, the third straight Apertura title for Liberta for Daniel Ganero's side, his eighth league title as a manager, winning titles at Guarani Olimpia. Now Liberta, he has tied the legendary Luis Cuvilla for most league titles uh, in Paraguay. So it's uh, it's been a remarkable season for them. Obviously, 47 points. They were able to do that by defeating Olimpia 1-0, but thanks to a win for Henry Caballero against Cerro Porteño, that all but confirmed the league title. So, I mean, Fede, I wanted to go to you on this one because I think... We had said it even at the beginning of the, the show. I even remembered. I, I picked Lieber thought to you know to be up there to become one of the the top favorites. I don't remember if they were the favorite. I'm guessing no, considering my predictions. Uh, I had to double check, but you know they were always still in the fight. And you know you saw teams like Trinidad and so who are still had a, they're having a good season so far. They're in third place right now, so they, they've been kind of the surprise package, you would say, uh, in this league. You know, Santa Bartenio also they're kind of finding it out. They had to change managers from uh, Chiqui said to Sava during the beginning of the year. Um, I think, you know, looking at other teams like Guarani, Olympia definitely disappointed, you know, right now in seventh in the league. But I think ultimately this was kind of really not a surprise, you know, 15 wins, two draws, two losses compared to Cedro's 10 wins and seven draws and two losses. I mean, this is something that I think Leroy thought took advantage of, of Cedro dropping so many points that, yeah, obviously they beaten them uh, when they did face each other uh, a couple weeks ago, but still, I think this was Libertad's title to lose, and I think it's credit to really just how Ganerdo has really managed this side in, in really league titles. I mean, yeah, everything can doubt about like how good he is internationally in Libertad Ordes or Sudamericana, but you can't really doubt his his legacy in, in seasons and league action. So I guess is it time to put Ganerdo into that kind of Hall of Fame? Like we mentioned Cuvilla and all those other managers, but is, is it time to put him amongst the greatest managers of all time to manage in Paraguay football? No, oh, that, that's a great question, and I, I I think it is. I think he's already there. I think he's sitting at the crown right now. I, I mean, seeing everybody else, uh, I think the only one that probably was fighting that spot was Chiqui Arce with Cerro Porteño not long ago because he was – he was being stable there. He was getting uh, league titles also, but just but not at the rate that Carnero has done it. Uh, and, and not only in, in, in Libertad lately. I mean, we're talking about a coach that has done it in Guarani, first of all, and then did it also in Olympia. And Olympia's team played a lot like this Libertad is playing now. I mean, blowing up just by everybody and with players that are playing on, a, on their high, highest level. And just credit to them. Uh, we, we still got three games left, guys. I mean, when when you blow a, a, a championship like that, when you when you blow past everybody this way, I mean, it, it's it's just all on on them and the way that he's managed each game. I mean, I remember that Pfizer against Cerro Porteño. I remember those big games where where you thought that Libertad could could lose, and it wasn't on those games. I mean, Libertad only lost two games. They lost against, I believe, Olympia, and that last surprisingly lost was against Taquari. Nobody was waiting for that one. And after Taquari uh, beat Libertad on that game, they never, they never won again in the league. So it was, it was a weird one. And, and then Libertad just did everything pretty much perfectly from the goalkeeper who I believe had 11 clean sheets out of the 19 that, that he played along this season. So amazing numbers from, from him in the defense. He changed it up uh, around but got the leaders, especially Barbosa, focused. I mean, all those experienced players, they all chipped in. And it was also Oscar Cardoso's uh, championship. It had a lot to do with him. He had a great season. And on the day of his birthday, he he, he scored the, the championship goal also. So, I mean, it was just like a storyline to me. And it was just beautiful to see. Uh, Libertad fans really came out. They, I, I, I came out uh, in a sense, but uh, also many were waiting for Cerro Porteño to do it, Roberto, to be honest with you. Uh, I think a lot of Libertad fans thought, we're not going to get it done on this on this game. and We're probably going to have to wait for another one. Cerro's going to do it at home. But this Cerro Porteño, and I was rooting for them, to be honest. I, I, I thought that they could win a couple of more games. I thought they could, they could uh, extend the situation a bit longer, but it, it just wasn't the... the it, it wasn't for them, and they just had, didn't have enough. 
Olibe had their injuries, Guarani had their injuries, so all the big teams were pretty much uh, out out of the out of the race. So big props to Libertad who know how to do it in the Apertura. They know they don't know how to do it in the Clausura because after they after all this parting and we've seen it in these last three years after all this parting in the Apertura after after getting one title every year they they're done. They they don't do much in the Clausura. I want to see what this, what what Garnero can get out of these guys now because they have to play their ass out in the Libertadores. They got to do a big camp. They got to do a great tournament there and they got to do something in the Clausura. I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not, I'm not all out on this team yet. I mean, they got to do more this year. Uh, The thing about the Clausura is interesting, right? Because yeah, just the way the Paraguayan league is set up, by winning the Apertura, they're in now for the Libertadores next year. So there's not actually, there's there's no kind of real ex- incentive to win the Clausura other than, than pride, I guess. Um, but we know from experience that Garnero has managed to win both titles in a year because he did that with Olympia. With Olympia, they were kind of just, uh, what's the word, like... Um, unstoppable and just and just kept winning those titles one after the other. So he was able to keep them motivated, those players. But here, what when you talked about the Clausura, I was also thinking about last year. So so last year in the Apertura, Libertad took a record point total of 57. By the way, they can still get 56 points this year. They've got three games left. In theory, they could get 56, which would be incredible. But then between last Apertura and this Apertura, there was that Clausura where they were they were very bad. They were honestly did not play very good football. One of the things was they conceded lots of goals. So I think bringing in Diego Vieira more than anything has been a really good uh, move by Garnero because Vieira has been he's he's not very mobile and he's not very exciting, but he's just a very good central defender that can basically stop goals. They have the best uh, the best defense in the league for a reason. So that's one of the changes he made from the Clausura. And then the other thing was, remember the Apertura this time last year, they had the top scorers, Julio and Ciso. So now it's like, well, you don't have a Premier League ready player in your team. So what's going to be the difference here? And what he's done is he's gone back to basics with Oscar Cardoso because Cardoso has come in and he's now the top scorer at 40 years old, which I think is incredible. So he's used the European quality, but just at the other end of their career instead of, the youngster, but he has found a couple of youngsters as well, right? And that's what Libertad's always able to do. So the player that's been exciting the last few games has been Enzo Gonzalez, who's only 18, and he's really come alive. I think when I watched him in the early games this season, he didn't really, he didn't seem to have much influence in the games. You could see he's talented, but he wasn't really a difference maker. Now in the last few games, and along with him and uh, Sanabria, they've been they've been assisting goals and they've been making key passes. Uh, Diego Gomez as well, who's another youngster. So suddenly you can see even like a bit of competition for these older players and a bit of renovation. So that's, I think, exciting for Libertad going into the Clausura. But now, as as I think both of you guys have have pointed out so far, there's just this huge pressure on on the Libertadores because (laughs) this has been the thing that Garnero can't quite get. He can win league titles. He's won it with three different clubs, right? Which is also proof that it's not just, say, having the money at Libertad because he, well, Olympia had money the time he was there, but he did it even at Guarani. So I think we know he's a very good coach. But there's something about these continental competition, like he hasn't quite got the team to click. And so this is a huge game tonight. They play Alianza Lima in Peru and they have to win it because they lost the home game. It's win or bust. And they have to win it after coming off the celebrations of having won the league. So there's no time for a hangover, right? They have to go straight into it. Yeah, guys. um, And I agree with with you guys uh, on that. I think that, Libertadores now are switching into that Libertadores mode, you know, um, with with no time to celebrate pretty much. And, and you know, I think they have about, what, two two or three games that um, that they have to play in the Libertadores if they want to, uh, you know, turn it around and, 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 and win the, the group stages because they're currently in, in, you know, the last, the, the last place. So um, it's a totally different um, uh, competition for them, you know, they're, they were, you know, they, they get to win the, the, the Apertura and now they're struggling so much in the Libertadores. It's, it's the craziest thing. It's like 
you know, like they are completely a different team when it comes to to these um, competitions. So um, hopefully, let's see if they they do make something out of this. Uh, you know, maybe this a win in the Apertura gives them a little bit of motivation to continue in the, in the Libertadores. Um, like you guys said, they do need uh, to conquer this competition, and they haven't done so. So. Um, you know, let, let's see if, if it's a, if it's a good turnaround for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously now switching gears to the Libertadores because obviously we have three big games and also looking into the Sudamericana as well, you know, looking into that as well. I just wanted to just glance by it real quick and look at the, the what's the, the case so going the Sudamericana first. We got Guarani currently in last, but all, <clears throat> excuse me, all the teams are separated by two goals in goal, sorry, four goals in goal difference. Huracan is in, in the lead with plus two and one knee is last with minus two. So that's how close it is really for all of these teams. They do have to go to Uruguay to Montevideo to take on Danubio uh, in this game for what I need going into Taquaru, kind of the, the side that I think everyone is not expected to do well, but they did get a win against Oriente Petrolero the other day in the Defensores. So that kind of boosts them up just a bit, but they do have to take on uh, Estudiantes, you know, Taquaru currently with three points in third place just four points behind Estudiantes in the second place round, a second place spot in Red Bull Barbantino as the leaders. In the Lierta Artists, the case goes as followed. You have Cerro Porteño currently last with just only three points, one win and two losses. They do have to take on Palmeiras, a Palmeiras side who, you know, obviously is kind of the favorites to win the Copa Lierta Artists, one of the best teams in all of South America. This is the game, and it's at home, a must-win for both Cerro, for Cerro Porteño if they want to get any chance of going into the round of 16 and having some chances of moving on. Looking at Libertad, they have to take on Alianza Lima in Peru. You know, Alianza, and Alianza, Alianza Lima side that has been able to, you know, beat them already over there in Asuncion, you know, kind of getting their number as well and, and getting also results against Atletico Paranaenses. So this is another game that Libertad has to win to continue their hopes of going into some sort of competition in the in South America. And as for Olympia, to cap it off, they take on Patronato over there in Paraná, Argentina, uh, currently with five points, just two behind Atletico Nacional, who are the leaders for that final spot in the round of 16. So, Ralph, I'll go to you on this one. You know, obviously, they got five teams fighting um, in theory, they're still in contention for something. I mean, you know, I think it's it's really the must wins for the likes of Cerro and Libertad and even for the likes of Guarani as well. I think Taquaru, you know, it, it's going to be tough for them to get a result against a really good Estudiantes side. I think Olympia are in a good spot, you know, being able to get a win against Patronato. But how have you been able to fare all of these teams? And do you give any hope at all for them to, to get some sort of result in in their games this week to continue their dream, I guess, of going into the Copa Sudamericana or into the Copa Libertadores. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, firstly, it's, it's a really uh, very challenge for the three teams if we look at the Libertadores first, right? Because for Libertad, it's in theory an, an easier game because you play against the Peruvian side. The other two sides in their group are, are from Brazil. But we've seen that Alianza Lima have are showing some quality that, that maybe we haven't seen previously. Remember, this is a team that famously doesn't, doesn't win in the Copa Libertadores. That, that win against Libertad comes after, I think, is something like 30 games that they were unable to win. Um, but we've seen from this year, obviously, each year these teams change so much in terms of their, their personnel that they have been a bit stronger. So is it, it is a difficult trip for Libertad. It's In a way, it's not ideal that it comes after winning the league because of, I'm sure they were the players were celebrating a little bit. But also, I think it's a good time now that they don't need to worry about what team he's going to put out at the weekend, right? I mean, the, the league doesn't matter anymore. So they can they can really go full throttle in in this game, I, I think Libertad have enough. I think they've done it in the past. They they can win away from home in the Libertadores. They they've proved this before. So it's it's really they have the quality to do it. With we didn't mention all the players. We didn't even mention like Tito Vialba, for example, Melgarejo. I mean, they they have such a good team and and a strong squad that I think they should be able to do it against against Lima. And then you have Olympia's trip to. 
to Argentina is arguably not too difficult because remember Patronato are not even in the top division. Um, but what we're seeing with Olympia is that they're really struggling to, to score goals or to see out games and usually both. So we're, we're seeing a lot of draws. They seem to draw a lot of games and it's often because they can't score a second goal and they can't keep a clean sheet. So they need to score two goals basically to try and win games. And part of the problem they can't score two goals is because Delis Gonzalez is not there through injury. That's, that's been a huge miss. And then part of the difficulty in conceding goals is he can't work out his defense. So we, he's tried, a, let's say, I think Zarate and Gamara together. He's tried Alcaraz with Zarate. He's, you know, he's, he's been moving around his central defenders and he's never really getting what he wants. Probably Alcaraz has been the best defender this year, but remember he's 40 years old and he's not very mobile. And so it's, he's not an ideal kind of candidate, especially for teams, if any team that has any kind of speed on the break or, or speed in their team. So again, Olympia in theory, it's, it's a winnable game, but we're seeing they're having difficulties getting wins. So we might end up, I wouldn't be surprised if that game's a draw because of what we're seeing from Aguirre's team, that they can't quite grind out the results. And then last for Serra, I mean, oof, this is very difficult to play Palmeiras. And in any time, this particular moment for Serra is not a good one. Then they're, they're not high on confidence. Again, they've just lost to General Caballero. I mean, Palmeiras is in another universe to that team. So there's there's a real danger. I think that they they could get beaten quite badly. They they played very well against Palmeiras in the away game, but we then saw what they did against Bolivar when they weren't fully focused. And so this Palmeiras team, there's there's always the potential that they could really kind of overrun uh, Cerro. And and remember, this is a team. The Brazilians they they kind of live for this. They thrive on the big. I'm sure there'll be a big crowd. There'll be lots of people. They they're not put off by that. They enjoy that. Uh, Gustavo Gomez is going to enjoy being there and everybody kind of uh, booing him and all that kind of stuff. He didn't mind about that last year. I was there at the game. He he'll still put in a good performance with the Palmeiras shirt, which he always does. So for Cerro, I mean, it's it's, it's very very tough. The, the best I could hope for, I think, and see is, is that they, maybe they, they get a point. But I can't see Cerro doing enough, especially from what they've shown the last few weeks, to win this game. Cerro has now been able to maintain themselves uh, 90 minutes, Rob. That's been their problem, right? I mean, uh, uh, alongside the fact that they haven't been able to keep that clean sheet like they used to with with a good defense and with a good midfield. I mean, you don't know what you're going to get out of this team, to be honest. It's probably the worst time to face Palmeiras, a giant in, in, in South America. I don't really, I have to go to this game. I don't know what I'm expecting out of this uh, match in particular, especially after what happened to Cerro Porteño. I mean, that locker room is going to be, I, I don't know, a funeral probably these, these lays, these, these next practices, you know, after losing the championship and waiting for huge match like this it's never easy for the player I, I want to see just how they they handle that pressure on a, a huge game like this one if they can actually get a tie I'm not expecting them to win Palmeiras is just cruising by every game just like they, they've done these last couple of years they got their best players back also they're on top shape Gustavo Gomez pretty much scores every game he's done it against Cerro Porteño also lately just like Rob is saying He's kind of enjoying the situation because he's also a player that is, you know, he, he doesn't care about Olympia. He doesn't care about several for the Well, he cares a little bit more about Olympia from what I've heard. But, uh, he, you know, he, he used to play for Libertad here. So, you know, he, he doesn't go for one of the big ones here. So he and he's and he's somebody that's that's always criticized by the Paraguayan scene, uh, by, by the Paraguayan uh, football fans. So he wants to have a big game, uh, an impact in these kind of matches. And he's always had. Uh, I, I'm expecting for Cerro maybe maybe on the best case scenario get a, a tie to be honest I am expecting for Libertad to get it done uh, against uh, Alianza Lima I mean this is something that they have on their shoulders this is something that they gotta get done I mean you, you could you, you, there's no way you lost against this team in Asuncion that, that was just a tragedy and I, I hope they show that in, in this game in, in Peru and that they really put themselves up there with an opportunity to really qualify to the next stage. If not, they're going to be pretty much 
out of the conversation. And I, I'm expecting for Water Knee also to step up because they got a couple of players that are coming back in, in the Sudamericana. Uh, they got Camacho back uh, mainly, which is probably the best player in, in offense with uh, their best uh, uh, Federico Santander now, who's pretty much scored in every match in the Sudamericana. So hopefully these guys, you know, they can get their heads in that competition because they have not done well lately. In the league, there's, there's a lot of people talking about what's going on with this team that also, just like Central Porteño, is kind of melting down uh, right at the end of the season. And for Olympia, I'm going to leave it there for Maria because I want to hear her thoughts about this huge game against Patronato. I mean, they got an easy thing to do, Maria. They got an easy group. We've said it ever since we saw that draw. If Olympia don't get out of this group, I mean... I don't know what Olympia is doing, to be honest. They, they should have let gone of this coach a long time ago. I, I heard uh, Diego Guerrero was probably rumored that he could have gone to Inter. Please let him go. He has not done anything so far. I, I think Olympia uh, did it against themselves when they let go of their last manager, Julio Casas. I still don't get my head around that situation. And uh, ever since Diego Aguirre has taken over, the team has not looked good at all. They have not won in over a month. And Ralph still cannot get over the fact that Dennis Gonzalez is out injured. They can, they haven't gotten a replace for him yet, Maria. I don't know. You guys lately, you guys are cheering after a tie, to be honest. You, you're not getting more than that. You are not the only one, Fede, to be thinking that way. <laughs> so it, it, I know, I know it's been a, a rough year, like I said earlier, for Olympia. Um, Ralph mentioned the fact that they're not able to score. And, you know, I, I have said that before. I said, you know, they, they need to work on their scoring uh, abilities because they only get to score one, two goals max, you know, luckily, if, if they ever do. Um, and, you know, and the defense, let's not even talk about the defense because they that's something that, that they haven't figured it out for some reason. Um, they need a, a new key player. You know, they don't have a key player. They don't have star on the team anymore. Uh, Derlis Gonzalez, unfortunately, because of the injury, it has, you know, like you guys said, it has completely turned the team around. Um, I don't know what they are expecting uh, with this new coach. Uh, you know, like you like you said, he hasn't done much. Uh, he's, uh, you know, just he hasn't figured out the team. Uh, so I, I, there's just so much going on right now. And I think the fact that they that they couldn't get the apertura, um, it, it, it's going to probably open their eyes and, and, and see, you know, maybe we can switch on to the Libertadores. Fortunately, they're still there hanging on by a thread, you know, um, believe in second place in, in, the, in the group stage. Still have a few games to, to continue. But, yeah, uh, they are kind of lucky in the sense that they are going to play against Patronato and and you know uh, hopefully they take advantage of the situation and 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 not you know um, get you know the, not not get their their butt beaten by by them because uh, you know, sometimes you never know sometimes you know these teams can really surprise you and 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 come back and bite you but um, yeah uh, Olympia has a lot of work to do in this um, in this off season once the the apertura is done. They really need to figure out what other player they can bring in because it's, it's just not looking good. They can't they can't depend on one player like Derlis Gonzalez and and you know um, I don't know what they're gonna do with their financial situations, but uh, they gotta turn bring in some kind of money so that they can find a, a, a star player for their team, someone that can really uh, put the, this team back up there. Uh, like the golden days. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, uh, Libertadores hopefully is um, a still a, a good, um, you know, if they do continue into the next stage of the of the Libertadores, maybe they can gain some kind of uh, money and that can help their situation a little bit as well. But it's just, it's, it's tough. It's been tough. Um, it, there's just been a blast a blah uh, kind of team this season. And, and it's just, it's sad because, you know, coming back from a, a glorious clausura, uh, it's, it's just, it's sad to see them um, turn around this bad, but, um, but yeah, 
it, it, you know, hopefully that hopefully this um this new this this off season they they turn things around. Yeah, certainly. I think for them, they definitely need some sort of like you know joy in them, and and really for a lot of these teams, they know that this is really the the what really defines their their season in a way that yeah some of them will still play like clausuras and whatnot but still this is what they want and this is want something that helps them you know financially as well and so i think it's very much important to see them get some sort of results this week so we'll definitely have to wait and see what happens there as we switch gears now i guess to, to close it off really like we would mentioned at the beginning of the show we have three players based in Europe. And, you know, I wanted to go on Maria on this one because I think, you know, you have always been a, a strong critic of Antonio Sanabria. I always like to to bully you on that. And here he is, you know, scoring, having the best season of his career uh, so far at Torino, you know, and, and looking at other players like, and for all you guys, really, Almiron performing well at Newcastle. At one point was the top goal scorer for them, but now here they are in the Champions League for the first time in 20 years. And, and for Enciso, a young kid, you know, like, Ralph had said as well, you know, had just been playing in Paraguay literally just a year ago over there at Libertad. Now he's starting week in, week out, majority and sometimes now, at least recently, for Brighton and Hove Albion, who are going to be playing in a European competition. We don't know if it's going to be Europa or the Conference League, but they will be playing in that competition nevertheless. So, yeah, I mean, you know, just I guess I'll start with Maria first and then jump into both you guys, really. I guess out of the three that you the three stories from the three players that you've been able to to follow. I mean, which one have you been very much more impressed of? And I guess happy to see after kind of this turnaround of his career. I think in CISO is a different ex- exception because he's kind of just starting. But for the likes of Migi and Sanabria, like just kind of like turning around their season with uh, a good performances for both Newcastle and Torino respectively. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to say I'm, I'm going to say all of them. To be honest with you, um, I'm really excited t- for all of them to have been um, going through this through this um, stage in their careers. Um, you know, for for Sanabria, I had I had seen that that spark in him since the beginning, and and I I really thought that he was gonna continue that um, into his career. But you know, he had a downfall for a while, and and you know now that he's finally coming back and and being able to 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 shine again it's really it's really um it really makes me happy because i i knew that there was something in him that that he can he can showcase and he really took advantage now in in italy and and he's doing his thing and and i'm i'm happy that he he found a place where he can where he can shine um and for enciso um you know i've been watching uh Brent's games uh lately and i really it really like warms my heart when you hear the the commentators talk about and see so like he's some, the next thing you know the next uh star and um you know just hearing him just seeing him how how, how good he's been playing and um that score that that goal that he had against arsenal i'm sorry Ralph. um i kind of just I was like, oh my God, uh, CISO and, and the chat and, and I totally forgot about Ralph. Um, but, you know, I think it was just the excitement of, of seeing him score and being such a young player um, in, in, in this, you know, in this uh, big league, you know, the Premier League, it's, it's not, it's not the Paraguay League, it's not the Brazilian League, it's not Argentinian League, it's, it's, it's England. So, um I'm I'm very I'm very happy for for him and I hope that he continues to shine the way that he's doing, and and for for the the team to give them that that spot in in this uh, in this competition you know it's it's really a big deal for them I, I don't think they realize how much of a big deal it is for us Paraguayans to see our people shine the way that they are, and you know what can we say about Miguel Abiron? we got we have been following him for all these years. Um, you know, and and we always had faith in him, and and look how far he's coming now. Um, you know, he he's had several opportunities to to bring his team to to the to the top of of the of the, of the competition, and you know, uh, a few championships. Um, and unfortunately, he couldn't make it, and the team couldn't make it. But you know, finally um, uh, qualifying for the for the uh, um, 
uh, for the Champions League. It's, it's just something so big. And, and I think that um, he's, you know what I think, guys? I, I really think it's that haircut that has really made it for him. Finally, you know, blending into the into the um, England lifestyle. And I think he, he put a nail in the coffin, you know, give, give me that haircut and I'm going to change my whole career around. And I think that's what did it. So I'm, I'm happy for them, for all of them. I did not notice that. I I I hadn't realized that, that he actually got a new hairdo. I I did not realize. Maybe it's a little bit longer or something like that. I don't know. Ralph can tell me if that's actually like a British haircut or, or not. If that's like a typical one. I, I'm happy for Miguel Almiron. I mean, his his career is just brilliant. I mean, all he needs to do is I don't know get paired white to the next World Cup, and uh, we can make uh, I don't know. We, we, we can do something very special for him in this country also because people talk about that here, you know. People are excited with Julio and Ciso because he's the next he's the next one. He's the new one. And, and you know, there's no he, – he doesn't have that tip on his shoulder maybe, you know. Uh, well, I guess uh, – but, hey, you saw the – but you saw the fight. He kind of saw the scuffle he had with Miggy as well. It shows, hey, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here to – obviously, it wasn't in, in bad faith. But what we saw, it's like, wow, okay, these guys got some – heat in them and i think it shows that that's, that's kind I, of important I think that's just the fire i just i think that's just the fire that julio has on it in him uh, that's not miggy's style you, you, you even saw miggy was kind of surprised about the whole situation he didn't like it at all he, he wanted some explanations uh, and then Cesar didn't want to have anything to do with that he didn't even want to talk he wanted the game to keep on going because he was fired up he wanted to go after the competition you know that, that's just him in the game uh, yeah, a lot of people are talking about that situation because that's something you don't see that much over there. I, I just think it's just part of the heat of the moment. But I'm happy to see that they're competing, that they're playing above all, and they're having a very important role in their team. Uh, I, obviously, uh, I, I don't know what Tony Sanario's situation is going to be, Roberto, in the next couple of months in the national team. I mean, we haven't seen him much lately. And I want to see if he can take all these goals that he makes in Italy. Uh, also with the Roja, he has not done well. Uh, every time every time he's putting that shirt and you can see by Maria's face that he doesn't want him there either. Uh, I love what I saw Gabriel Avalos last time around. So it, to me, in that starting role and center forward right now is still for him, for Gabriel Avalos. He is not playing in Europe, but he's scoring pretty much every weekend. He has a pretty good uh, average in that sense, and he's doing really well. I, I would put him even above Tony Sanabria right now and put him as a sub and make him earn that spot. I, I wouldn't give it right away to Tony Sanabria or maybe even to anybody. And 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 just to mention one fourth player, because you mentioned three, Diego Gonzalez, breakthrough season also in Italy, coming to Lazio, getting an opportunity even on the bench on the first team. That that kid just blew me away also this, this season. He was crying on the pitch when we couldn't make it to the World Cup, the under-20 World Cup. He was one of those players that you could see that, that really felt it. And to see him have this uh, end of the season, having his opportunity in Lazio, he has so much to look forward to, Ralph. Yeah, that's a great shout with Diego Gonzalez. He's such an interesting player that unlike, let's say, Julio and Ciso that we all knew about because he became top scorer in Libertad, the, one of the biggest clubs in Paraguay. Diego Gonzalez, because of the pandemic, had to leave Paraguay because there was no youth football going on. He ends up in Panama, then the second division in Mexico. And it's from there that he gets his big chance because then he's playing in the under-20 Sudamericano and that's where he gets spotted by, by Lazio and taken. And, and they didn't even want to take him uh, permanently, right? It was, a, it was a loan with the option to buy and because he did so well in the Primavera, the, the kind of youth team there, they won the league and he scored a, a bunch of goals. Then they've picked up on the option and now they're putting him in the in the first team squad. So that is a is a great story, I think. And, and as Roberto points out, they'll be in the Champions League next season as well. So there's another Paraguay in the Champions League after many years of not having our players at the top table in football. Um, for me to choose, by the way, of, of mine, I think for me, Miguel Almiron is, I just keep coming back to the guy is such a winner. We forget about it sometimes, I think, because in Paraguay, in the national team, he hasn't done as well, but he just, he's always been someone that won trophies. Now 
this is the equivalent of winning a trophy for Newcastle at the moment. They could actually go on and, and win the Premier League with some of the funding they have. But with, with teams like Manchester City at the moment, getting into the Champions League for Newcastle is a huge achievement. And you talked about the fight, Roberto, with uh, with Enciso. Well, it's more like kind of the verbal verbal fight, I guess. But remember, like just moments after that, he gets the assist. So that his way to his way to react has always been like, I'm just going to react by winning and doing something. And although he's not going to end the season top scorer, he was top scorer until about April. And then Callum Wilson has come back and started scoring lots of goals. And Callum Wilson's a top scorer. But really, I mean, he's just been such a key part of this transformation of Newcastle into the Champions League. So I think for me, you're seeing the Almiron that we remember from Cerro, from Lanús, from uh, Atlanta. And let's just hope that he can transfer this into the national team, which is the, the big challenge he has left, I think. That is, that's really it. I mean, we're, we're, we can all talk about these performances and seeing them do well, but at the end of the day, as cruel as it could seem, and I think Feather and, you know, Maria and Ralph and all of us can really understand, it's what you do when you put the Albi Roja on. That's all that matters. You could put up, example, maybe 30 goals or something, but if you're not doing that for the national team and you're not helping them win games and going to World Cups and performing well at Copa America or something like that, it doesn't matter. And that, that's the sad part of it all. But yeah, that's that's really the hope, really, is that, they put in the, their, their form. And like you said, they're coming in at the right time with the, the friendlies. Actually, they have a few friendlies uh, in, a, in a few weeks. Sorry, I think they only have one, actually, that they'll be playing uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So we'll see if they'll be able to participate in that and, and you know, hopefully find into, into some form under Guillermo Barros Cascalotto's team. And then come next September, that's when the qualifiers start. That's when the real deal starts with, hopefully using that form and what they were performing and obviously the experience now with them playing in competition, not just in the Premier League or in Syria, but also in, you know, championships like Champions League, Europa League, Conference League, whatever, using that to build that experience and then using that to help in the national team come next season. So that's the big hope. And obviously this is a week of hope for a lot of these teams as well as in Paraguay. So we, you know, close out another great episode of What I Need Vision for myself, Roberto Rojas, Fede Perez, Maria Britos and Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening in. See you soon.